you find yourself in a library, scrolling through books on the history of international relations. And to a surprise or disappointment, all books stayed the same. That international relations began in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia and the creation of the modern state. Why is it that Europe is always finding its way to the spotlight of academics? And you fall for the fact that in a Western world study, the focus will obviously be on its own history and perspective. But that couldn't be all of it. There must be someone at least that debunks this whole Eurocentric scheme. And through hours and books of research, the aspect of international systems appear. And with it, the existence of these units called city-states, which appeared millennia before the Peace of Westphalia. But you still have some questions like, why do scholars assume then that the Peace of Westphalia was so important in the field of international relations that they should proclaim it as the start? And if Sumerian city-states were only the beginning, there must be some other examples, previous to Westphalia, which follow the same patterns as this. This finding is all an achievement, and you write on your notes, despite the assumptions of many academics, international relations didn't begin in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia. They began with the Sumerian city-states in the year 3500 before the Common Era. After that, they didn't stay the same. Instead, they evolved and endured, being present in many parts of the world. A famous example of that is the Byzantine Empire. The Peace of Westphalia was signed in 1648 and ended the Thirty Years' War through the creation of the framework of modern international relations. The concepts of state sovereignty, mediation between states and diplomacy were established. It was one of the first attempts at codifying international law, essentially providing the basis for the creation of future supranational entities such as the European Union or the United Nations. The Thirty Years' War lasted between 1618 and 1648. It was a conflict between Catholic and Protestant states, which gradually evolved to become a conflict involving the major European superpowers of that time. Before 1648, war was considered as an acceptable and legitimate mean for foreign policy within two different states and or political entities. However, once the Peace of Westphalia was finally signed, war should was considered to be a useful mechanism only as a last resort. Other mechanisms should be used prior, such as diplomacy. Furthermore, as I have mentioned previously, the concept of state sovereignty was also introduced, meaning that a state could not interfere in the internal or national issues of another state. Same as we consider relations between individuals a common aspect of the existence of humans, it is also important to determine the relations between groups of individuals. We could date the start of these relations together with the beginning of the humankind especially in hunter-gatherer societies, in which authority, like resources, was dispersed rather than concentrated. This doesn't mean that these societies lived in total isolation from each other, but that the level of interaction was so low or indirect that we could not consider it to form an international system. But what is an international system? We consider an international system to be a group of state-like structures that maintain relationship at a relatively high degree of intensity over time and in several sectors, such as commerce, culture, diplomacy, and war. Therefore, city-states, especially the ones in summer in the year 3500 before the Common Era, should be considered the first international systems to be known and studied. These started as settled agriculture societies that later developed cities that started accumulating wealth and knowledge, specializing and dividing the labor and creating a common culture and religions. Sumerian city-states were located near the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, a useful setting for both agricultural and trading purposes, since they lived on their crops to maintain their growing population and to trade with the leftovers. Many of the disputes between cities 
derived from the use of water and the bounds of these fields. Culture and religion was also crucial for Sumerian city-states. It was a way of uniting the system and legitimizing its authority. Every city belonged to a different god, which at the same time was under a great god. This reflected how the cities were organized, since at different stages, one city would have authority over the others and its ruler would have authority over the others. Not only that, but this king also served as a moderator between the cities. As Watson argues, the system was a hegemony in which its ruler was accorded legitimate authority and power to act between other cities as a moderator, but not the right to interfere in their internal affairs. The ancient era in which Sumerian city-states existed was lengthy, which means that many units coexisted at the same time, from nomadic tribes to empires. Therefore, these units often had contact with each other. These relations involved trade of products, and that came along with influence of ideas. The matter that was central in relations between Sumerian cities was how to regulate the commerce and competition between them, and how to resolve the disputes over land, water, and trade, so that they could prosper and still maintain their independence. As a result of the interactions, these city-states also influenced other rules that were nearby. For example, Egyptian diplomatic records were written in Aramaic with the Sumerian cuneiform characters. After stating the importance of the Peace of Westphalia Treaty and the Sumerian city-states in the debate over the beginnings of international relations, it would be wrong not to include the role of the Byzantine Empire not in the beginning of IR but in its development. This is because the Byzantine diplomacy is highlighted by its principles, ideas and strategies, which offer them an advantage in interacting and negotiating with its neighbors. Let us begin with a small introduction. The Byzantine Empire was established roughly after the fragmentation of the Roman Empire in 365 CE, and it ended with the fall of its capital Constantinople in 1453. What was so special about this empire was that it had a somehow sophisticated way in managing their relations with its surroundings. First of all, they had a government body called the Bureau of Barbarians, which was a structure similar to a ministry today. Its role was to manage relations in rather democratic than military manners with its neighboring empires such as the Persians, the Germanics, the Slavs, and etc. The Bureau was also responsible for gathering information on the enemy as well as on the subordinate regions, which would today be considered an intelligence agency. Within this Bureau, the so-called Protocol Office was created. This office's function was to train envoys and interpreters for their negotiations and diplomatic missions. They also dealt with foreign envoys and merchants by trying to negotiate with them in order to settle decisions based on the information provided by the Bureau. The office was also responsible for appointing and trading the Logo Theta, which is our third point. The Logo Theta was a government official that could be compared to a foreign minister today or more specifically, a spokesman, since in practice, it was still the leader who decided on the foreign policy policies then. They went on long diplomatic missions and served as important agents in establishing relations across the territories they visited. They were also taught rhetorics as well as costumes and etiquettes, which at the time were very rigid. This leads us to our final point, which is propaganda. The empire believed, strongly believed, in fact, that by applying these rigid, rigid protocols, they would ensure that their image remained more legitimate and powerful to others, and that this was a crucial aspect of guaranteeing their peace and thus their success. Overall, after taking into account all the points mentioned before, we could come to a conclusion. This conclusion would be that despite the Byzantine Empire having nothing to do with the birth or beginnings of international relations, which in fact emerged during the Sumerian city-states, it did have an impact on how it was developed. This implies that they were not the first ones to create internal government structures to deal with their outside world, but that they were the first ones to use these tools systematically. They were also fonts of dealing with their outside world in a rather rather diplomatic way instead of through hard power, 
Wit is a strong characteristic characteristic of modern international relations. Therefore, it could be said that the Byzantine Empire and, the diplom and their diplomacy have pathed the way for the development of how international relations is carried out today. Instead of representing the birth of it, which obviously occurred during the Sumerian city-states. Therefore, as a conclusion to our video, we can clearly say and acknowledge the role of the Peace of Vespalia, being a unique and pioneer treaty, since it managed to end an ongoing religious conflict between the main European powers, and introduce modern concepts which are still used nowadays, such as nation-state, state sovereignty, and uh, diplomacy. However, if we really want to answer the question, when did international relations begin, then we must go back to the area of Sumerian city-states, which maintained contact through our culture, religion, and established a hegemony due to the interactions between them and with the neighboring communities and other forms of political entities. Furthermore, it is worth mentioning the importance of the Byzantine Empire in trying to understand the origins of international relations, although they did not intend the internal structures to deal with the foreign world, they did use them regularly and in a very systematic way, which could be said to have paved the path to today's foreign policy management. While it is of massive importance to international relations, it is generally accepted that the birth of it lies in much earlier times, during the Sumerian city-states, 